This is the Hacker Valley Studio Podcast, exploring the human element behind cybersecurity programs and technology. Axonius has crossed the chasm, the first company to solve the cybersecurity asset management problem. Gartner has recognized cyber asset attack surface management chasm as a category in their hype cycle for network security 2021 report. Axonius gives its customers a comprehensive, always up-to-date asset inventory, helps uncover security gaps, and automates as much of the manual remediation as you want. Take a look at Exonius and give your team's time back to work on the high value cyber initiatives they were trained to do. What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to the Hacker Valley Studio podcast. Chris and I, we love to speak about performance and taking the steps that we need each day to incrementally improve. But what's underneath all of this hope and desire to perform and be our best? Sometimes the hope stems from wanting personal or financial freedom. And other time, the hope stems from wanting more willpower to take action and overcome adversity. After speaking with Zara Carson, I learned that a lot of the actions that we take can be tied to our value system. Our value system and how we prioritize the things in our life and how it affects our love and happiness with the world. Zara has written one of the books on happiness and titled it Six Weeks to Happy. Zara also helps many people around the world with her company Get Zend, and it was an absolute pleasure to speak with her in this conversation. Without further ado, let's jump right into the episode. What's going on, everybody? You are in the Hacker Valley studio with your hosts, Ron and Chris. Yes, sir. Welcome back to the show. Glad to be back again. In the studio today, we have Zara Carson. Zara is a Wall Street Journal bestselling author and has authored the book, Six Weeks to Happy. Zara is also a trusted success coach and the CEO of Get Zend. Zara, I'm excited to learn about your philosophies on mindset. You know, that's one of our favorite topics. But most importantly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Chris and Ron. I appreciate it. I'm so excited to be here. So excited to have you on the show today. You talk about some of the things that we talk about quite often, and you've done your research, and it's definitely shown in your book. But for the folks that don't know who you are just yet, we'd love to hear a little bit about your background and what you're doing today. Sure. Well, as you said, my name is Zara Carson. I'm an author, success coach, and CEO of Get Zend. I have a background in neuroscience, positive psychology, and mindset coaching and consulting. So this really is my wheelhouse. In my 25-year career, I've worked as a trusted advisor to C-level executives, and I've managed projects that range in size from five to 50 million. And so that takes managing a lot of people as well. And part of being good at that job was having to learn to get, you know, really master how to read people so that you could inspire the best out of them and pull out and boost human potential and human performance. And I've used all of that research, both, you know, all the data in my in my actual studies as well as in my work experience to develop a set of simple strategies that people can use in about 10 minutes per day that will bring about lasting change. So if you want greater success, if you want more wealth, and you want that real joy and freedom and that happiness that you need, then this these are the tools that you want to hear about for sure. So let's start off with an easy question. I'm sure anyone out there can answer this. What is happiness? <laughs> happiness, honestly, in all of my studies was not easy to define. You know, you think, you know, it's in moments of joy, you can find it. But the reality is, is we are complex creatures and happiness, you know, as a definition is, is not that really easy. And I think that's why it's so elusive for most people. It's sort of a state of being, if you will, that allows you to have the physical elements of overall health and well-being 
it allows you to incorporate the mental and emotional balance and sense of peace and calm that you need. So in order, in other words, the removal of stress and those elements that cause anxiety and worry, and then includes as well new tools for being able to intentionally and consciously choose to be in an elevated state of mind in an um, you know in an abundant state of mind and to feel more joy and freedom on a daily basis so as i went through my research what i realized is there's no easy answer and we're not just the physical body so it's not just a question of health and nutrition and fitness for example to look after your physical body you know, people talk about sleep, for example, and, and improving your sleep quality. Well, there's so many little gadgets and wearables you could find that would monitor your sleep. But in fact, if you're having trouble sleeping, it's usually because you're under stress. So really tapping into what is causing us stress and distress and being able to remove those blocks, almost like a neurohack, if you will, to boost our human potential, to boost our ability to perform at the highest levels and be the best version of ourselves is what's necessary. And so I tried to really tap into what do we need? What is that magic formula that brings us to a place of feeling as though we're joyful, calm, peaceful, as though we have that certainty, freedom that we cannot fail no matter what we choose to do? And how do I deliver that in a simple set of strategies that I can teach people so that they can implement that change in their life? And what came out in the data and all of this research is you really can make that shift in just six weeks. So I hope you realize that I was being completely sarcastic about this easy answer for happiness because I don't (laughs) even as I read your book, I was like, what does happy really mean? to me. And so I think that a lot of people out there would have a hard time defining what happiness is. And why do you think it's so difficult for folks to really understand what that is across the board? Well, that's a great question. And I think the first thing I realized is that we're given sort of marching orders. Nobody really takes the time to be asked as we go through life. It's certainly in my generation, we weren't asked, what do you need today, Zara, that will make you happy? What do you need, Chris? And what do you need, Ron? You know, and are you living a life in a, you know, in alignment with what's important to you, the things that really light you up and make you feel good and make you feel as though you're thriving? And so I think part of it is, you know, we get we get a swim coach if we need to go learn how to swim as children. But here we are in the, you know, and we have sports coaches in school, but here we are wandering through this thing called life and we nobody has a map it doesn't come with an instruction manual you know and so nobody really took the time to ask what makes you happy and so i think that's why it's so difficult to really pinpoint it does you know we have four bodies we have a spiritual or energetic body we have a mental and emotional body and we have a physical body now If you just look at neuroscience and optimal brain health and you think maybe if I just get the right dose of neurochemicals, you know, those feel good hormones like serotonin and dopamine, then, you know, if I eat the right things and do the right things to to give my brain what it needs, maybe that'll result in happiness, but it doesn't work that way. Maybe if I look after my nutrition and exercise, the physical body, maybe I'll find happiness there. Sure. Exercise feels great great stress buster, gives us a lot of feel good feelings. Sure. But it's still not enough, isn't it? So there's something, there was something missing. And I just, I just was fascinated by the human condition and what this little formula is that we all need to to find because we're all seeking more joy and more peace and more freedom. And I don't just mean freedom, like, you know, I, I can, I can hop on a plane and go on holiday and I can feel free for a week, but that's, That's almost an escape from life. I'm talking about real freedom, like freedom of worry. You know, there's something really powerful in that when you don't have to worry about your bills getting paid anymore, when you know you have all the time, money and energy to do what you want and live the way you want. There's a different set of traits and there's a different kind of power in being able to access and uncover that. So that's what I was really interested in developing. And and like you said, it's it's not an easy answer. And the other thing I found that was interesting was it's not a one size fits all. You know, what makes Chris and Ron happy is different from each other. 
what makes me happy versus my siblings or my coworkers or my parents or my friends is completely different. We all have a unique set of values, the things that are really, truly important to us that make us feel like we're lit up, like we are excited and living this life in an exciting and adventurous way. For somebody else, they may value stability and routine. So figuring out who you are and really diving into that and then having the right tools to be able to live your life more effectively, I think is is so vital. And these are core life skills that nobody's really teaching yet. So I was excited to sink my teeth into it and see if I can give it a go. And I think I think we've come up with a good formula. It's an interesting situation that we're all in as humans, you know, batteries not included without an instruction manual. So it's very difficult to tune this beast of life. And you said <laughs> something that really triggered me. And, and it's one of the things I say to myself all the time is I'm seeking freedom, personal yes. freedom financial freedom and freedom of the spirit to like really express myself in the ways mm-hmm. that I want. What is your experience? Like what is a story that you can share with finding the freedom for you? And how does that relate to happiness exactly? One of the things you can do, and I talk about this in my six week program, and it's what led me to develop this book entirely is if you really think about what does success mean to you? Or what does happiness mean to you? What does freedom mean to you? What freedom means to me, freedom is actually one of my top values. And I go into how to define your values and then figure out how you can align your life with that. So for example, if freedom is an important value for you, like it is for you and for me, what does that mean in the context of a relationship, for example, in your personal relationships? Well, If you value freedom and autonomy, for example, then you're a fairly independent thinking person. You're a fairly independent person in terms of how you like to spend your time. You want to have freedom and flexibility, right? That's all sort of how freedom works. So how does that work in the context of a relationship, for example? If you're in a personal relationship where someone's more needy, more clingy, then you need to negotiate a different way of being and set different types of boundaries so that you can still have what you need and get that freedom within your relationship. Same thing for your work or your business or your enterprise, you know, whether you're an entrepreneur or a careerist working a, you know, a longer term job and working for a company is how do you cultivate that freedom in your personal life, in your relationships, and also at work. And so this book actually teaches you those tools for diving into your values, again, what's important to you. And if you can figure out what your top three to five values are and figure out what it's costing you in your life to not have it now and what it will bring to your life when you do have it, I promise you it's a game changer. So that's one of the tools we cover in this book. The second is we do a deep dive into your needs. So at the start of this program, we were talking about why happiness is so difficult to define and why it's difficult to achieve. So the second piece of it is if nobody's asked you, what do you need to feel you're most alive, to live like you're living your most excited and vibrant life, then this gives you the tools to actually dive into that. And I'll tell you an interesting story. As I was doing, you know, I've coached hundreds and hundreds of people. And one of the things you're called upon to do as a coach is to help people figure out where they are now and where they want to be and to figure out what the gap is. So what is preventing them from from having the life, the money, the wealth, the love, the relationships, the social community, that sense of belonging, that freedom, that certainty that they're longing for? What's missing that's stopping them from having it now? And then you put in place a plan for them to get there with measured goals and real milestones and things that they can actually put a plan against. And as we were doing this exercise, I realized that there was a very high percentage of people that couldn't even answer the question, okay, well, once we get to this goal, will that make you happy? What will that bring you? What will that give you? And so I realized we actually had to dial it back. I had to go back a step and create a system and sort of an analysis to help people understand what their needs are. So we sort of took that life wheel, you know, various areas, physical health and money and fitness and social connections and community and family and work and career. And we had to pull it apart. And so that people could actually then take a deeper examination 
of what they need to be happy. So those are two of the tools that we get into in the book. And it doesn't take a huge amount of time to go through it. It's just, you know, I think, I think anything's possible if you have time and knowledge. And so this is equipping you with the knowledge. You just have to put in a little bit of time to understand who you specifically are, what your unique needs are, and what's important to you. And once you have that understanding, you'll start to naturally, you easily see the gaps in your life or what's not being met. Because if your needs are not being met, and here's the thing, needs are non-negotiable. They are non-negotiable. If you're not having your need met over time, it starts to feel uncomfortable at first. And then over prolonged periods, we start to get irritated. We start to get, you know, uneasy, feel a discomfort with life. And soon enough, we have sadness, stress, anxiety, depression. We have chronic stress on the body. So really tapping into what it is you need and being able to design your life around it. That's something I'm really interested in is helping people structure that. The complexity of cloud infrastructure means every organization's security challenges are unique. Whether your challenge is threat hunting, policy management, cloud workload protection, or all of the above, Uptix helps you quickly identify and eliminate observability gaps in your security program. That's Uptix. Analytics for the modern attack surface, observability for the modern defender. Check out Uptix by visiting Uptix.com. That's U-P-T-Y-C-S dot com. Thank you, Uptix, for sponsoring this episode. When you talk about designing your life, it sounds so fantastic. One of my biggest fears in life and something I've been afraid of since I was a little kid is this feeling of being controlled. And one of my biggest fears of all time is going to prison. I don't break laws all the time. So I don't want you to think I'm some type of criminal, but it's just the thought of not being able to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And then I think of folks that are listening to this podcast. A lot of folks are entrepreneurs. A lot of folks are technologists or cybersecurity pr professionals. And sometimes we don't feel like we have a lot of our own personal control in our lives because we're beholden to different things. We're beholden to those bills. We're beholden to our boss. We're beholden to the people that depend on us. So how do we start to bring our control back into our hands and away from the rest of the world? Well, that's a great question. So here's the thing is we actually evolved to be good at survival. We didn't evolve to be good at happiness or thriving or success for that matter. We are 5% conscious mind and 95% subconscious, so unconscious mind. Most of us, you know, most of how we think, feel, and operate actually happens without our conscious awareness. So imagine we wake up and we're, you know, going through our day and how we live our life is just in that sliver, that 5%. That's all that's in our conscious experience. All behavior, for example, sits at the unconscious level. So in that 95%. So it's no wonder that we haven't been able to master ourselves or this thing called life because it's like navigating, you know, navigating through life with an outdated map that only shows 5% of the roads. I mean, how do you get, to, how do you even find a destination to find a destination without knowing that? So the brain is like a computer, a supercomputer, and your mind is the operating system. Now we know that your computer is only as good as your operating system. So if your brain and your, in your mind, that 95% of you is designed to be efficient, it's designed for survival, not designed to do what's best for you to bring you happiness and joy. So imagine how much power you could have if you learn to tap into that 95% and what houses all of your fears and self-doubt, all of those strategies that we use to stay safe, to stay alive, and to survive is housed in that 95%. So it's like we're running on autopilot with that operating system. Our subconscious is running the show. So if we could learn to tap into that 95% and instead of survive, we learn the tools we need to really thrive. That makes all the difference in the world. I really want people to thrive. And after studying thousands of people over the 25 year period, you know, I started to see patterns in the data. 
And what it comes down to is that all of our fears really fall into about five different categories. And I can't get through all five now, but we do get into it in the book. And but I'll, but I'll cover a couple of them just to give you some examples of how that might play out in your life. And most of us don't have all five of these fears. Most of us have just one or two that are operating at a, at a high level. But if you can recognize what those fears are, recognize your patterns, then you can make the shift. If you can't see it, it's like it's like you're you're in the fog, right? So how do you know how to navigate if you can't see your way out of it? If you can see it, you can navigate away from it. So one of the things, uh, you know, I think is most common, one of the fears that's most common is this feeling I'm not enough or this feeling that I'm alone. I don't have support in this world. And so the interesting part about that is they don't really always sound exactly like that. So you can see the I'm not enough one. Everyone has some flavor of this. This is part of being human as part of the human journey. So, you know, for example, with money and wealth, if you have some unconscious story happening around money or around your ability to create money, it might not sound like I'm not enough, I'm not smart enough. What it might sound like is not everyone is meant to create that much wealth. It's not for everyone. Or maybe I don't have the education to get there, or maybe I don't have the creativity to get there. It might sound a little bit different, but what it really comes down to is an unconscious belief of not feeling like you're enough. And the same thing with that whole idea of, you know, feeling alone or no support. It doesn't sound like I'm alone in this world. It might sound more like, um, uh, what's a common expression I can use. For example, if I want something done right, I have to do it myself. I can never rely on someone else. So these mm. things play out in all areas of our lives. So really being able to tap into those blind spots and be able to move those away is extremely powerful. You know, it sounds like you're 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 describing in some ways automatic negative talk for some people. Like there is this internal dialogue that we have that is kind of questioning the actions or decisions or even the things that we've experienced in our lives is questioning those those elements. And you're you're mentioning rewiring it. What are some of the things that you do initially when it comes to changing that negative outlook into something positive? Uh, great question. Uh, well, firstly, you know, I realized in my in my neuroscience research that the brain is not actually static. It's malleable and changeable and dynamic over time. What that means is the brain actually, you know, as we think and we feel all of those thought patterns and feelings get bundled together. So let's say you wake up in the morning and you think, okay, I'm going to start my day. You start already feeling stressed about your day. Like we start feeling stressed about Monday on Sunday evening, right? Mm -hmm. So all of that programming already takes hold because we've already hardwired that into our brain. So we wake up, we know Monday's going to be busy. Sunday night already starts to feel that, you know, the stress of that. And what are the thoughts that go with that? Oh, I have so much to do this week. How am I going to get to it all? Will I have the energy to get to it all? You know, maybe I, I don't know if I'll, how many days a week will I get to work out? So all of those thoughts, they start to run. And then all of the feelings that go with it start to get accompanying those. So you get into, uh, you know, feelings of stress and worry and anxiety, and then you have physical visceral responses in your body, tightness in the chest, your breathing gets a little tighter, shorter, you know, you start to feel stress and tension in your neck and all of those things, the thoughts, the feelings, the physical components all get bundled together and they get hardwired into your brain and into your neurological system, your mind-body connection, if you will. So the next time Sunday evening happens and you have that thought, oh my God, I have such a busy week ahead of me. All of those other thoughts and feelings and visceral physical responses, they all come flooding back. Why? Because they're bundled together. We hardwired them over repetition, years and years and years of this. So the first thing you can do is recognize that the brain works in a specific way. If you understand the education of how the brain works and you understand how to use it for your advantage, well, that's powerful. Then if you learn about the language of the subconscious and what's actually creating all of that fear and the negative inner internal dialogue, as you mentioned earlier, 
you know, what is the source of that stress and anxiety? What is the source of that fear? And it really comes down to these five main fears. And if you can name it and you can recognize it, you can learn to shift it. And then there are some tools and techniques in the book that I go through as well to start to actually retrain your brain. So you're retraining it away from this negative inner dialogue because you're recognizing it and learning how to shift your mindset. Then you're learning how the brain and the body works. And so you're retraining your brain back to calm and away from stress. We've gotten so good at stress, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Over the years, we're actually wired to be on high alert for danger. We're actually wired for stress and survival. We're not wired for happiness or wealth or abundance for that matter. So over time, what we've done, we have a built-in stress response called the fight or flight response. And what we've done over time is we have strengthened our ability to respond to stress and threats. So if you think about every time your phone pings, I mean, how many channels do we have right now to attend to? My gosh, we yeah. have all of our social channels. We have email, voicemail, text message, WhatsApp. Now people can DM you on, on social media as well. You have LinkedIn. And so every time something in your life calls upon you, it requires your time and your energy. And every time something happens like that, whether it's your phone pinging or it's a family demand or a work-related demand or something that requires you to spend money or pay the bills, it requires time and energy. And so what it does is it creates a state of stress. Mm -hmm. And what we've done over time is we've strengthened our stress response so much, we've actually forgotten that we have a natural ability to become calm. It's very difficult to be stressed and happy at the same time. It's very difficult to be stressed and hyper-focused and productive at the same time. Don't you find you're more productive when you're relaxed and happy? Oh, yeah. Right? Absolutely. You've had that experience of like uh, being in the shower, or driving to work, and you just get the most amazing ideas just pop into your head because you're relaxed and you're not actively thinking about the stress. So that's Absolutely. a perfect, yeah. So that's a perfect example. So, you know, you find the techniques to, to retrain back to calm. You remove the stressors by understanding what's causing the stress, the fear, the anxiety then you have a space to create a new vision for your life. And then you can design what you want. You're making so much sense right now, especially when you think about being under stress and being able to not only perform better, but to be happy. And when you think about athletics, a lot of the times the best performance you're going to get is when you're almost disconnected from the outcome of whatever it is you're trying to do. You shoot the shot better when you're not focused like, oh, what if I miss or what if something happens or this, that or the other? You really get a better performance when you just kind of settle into yourself and not be overly connected to that stress or the pressure. Yeah. One thing that I wanted to bring up is in your book, you talk about something that I wouldn't say I've struggled with. I've had a love hate relationship with willpower and <laughs> using willpower to get things done. One of the things that's been hardest for me in my lifetime is this concept of my weight and eating right and willpower. I read a, a book uh, just recently, both Ron and I read it called Awareness by Anthony DeMello. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the more you fight against it, the more you renounce it, the more power you give to it. So yes. that my struggle, my addiction was always food. Like, oh, I, but, but I love it so much. I, I, I can't do it. You know, I, I, I need to get rid of it. And it always sneaks back in. It's always sitting there waiting for me to have a weakness or a crack. What uh, this willpower and ego deletion concept within your book, could you tell us a little bit about that and how we can apply it in our lives? Absolutely. So when we talk about willpower. So we're talking about they're connected. So ego depletion is not ego as in, you know, your, your grand ego. Ego depletion is really recognizing that we are a being and ego depletion is really about what components in our life drain us of energy and deplete us of energy. So that's what ego depletion is. And so what's really interesting when you mentioned willpower in terms of diet and nutrition, um, being on a diet or doing anything that is restricting your behavior actually takes energy. So by the end of the day, if you've really struggled to be on a particular eating regimen, 
that actually drains you of energy. So ego depletion is really, these are the things that, that deplete your ego. And once you have depleted your energy stores, your willpower is shot. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's that's a really interesting trick. So that the, what are the things that that take your energy throughout the day? The easy ones are, you know, work. Obviously, that takes energy. Family demands takes energy. Physical exercise or exertion takes energy, but it can also restore energy. Don't you feel? You know, sometimes you start a run. I'm sometimes I'm yawning fifteen or twenty minutes into a run. But by the time I'm done that workout, I get this surge of energy. So that's a that's both. It takes energy and restores. So the things that take energy that we don't think about are, for example, if you have pain, if you're in physical pain, just the simple act of ignoring the pain and telling your body to get on with your day, that takes energy. Multitasking takes energy because the brain doesn't actually multitask. It task switches and that switching right. of between tasks takes energy. Making decisions takes energy. Managing people takes energy. So if you've got competing demands in your life and in your work, all of that stuff takes energy. So as you're going through your day, you can start off with great willpower in the morning. You know, it's almost like a New Year's resolution at the start of each day. You do a a new morning resolution, if you will. Today, I'm going to be good on my diet. Today, I'm going to get my workout in. And you have all the energy in the world first thing in the day. By the time 6 p.m. rolls around, if you're a daytime work person, that starts to dwindle a little bit. Then you really have to kind of push yourself like, oh, what do I want to eat for dinner? You know, do I have the energy to get to a workout today, for example? And as you get to 10 p.m., all of that starts to fade. Everything that's taken your energy throughout the day starts to wear away at you. So what I give you in the book is just a whole set of tools to figure out how to examine your life and figure out all of the the easy and the less obvious ways that your energy is being depleted. Because when your energy is depleted, a number of things happen. Your willpower is highly reduced. So for example, think about when you have a glass of wine or a drink, whatever it is, your your drink of choice, for example. If you know you put a cake in front of me and I'm on a diet and I don't feel like eating that piece of cake, it's very easy to do that at 9 a.m. Put a glass of wine in me or maybe two glasses of wine and all of a sudden your judgment is impaired, your willpower goes right out the window Mm -hmm. and the cake all of a sudden just feels like the only choice. (laughs) Right. So you have to figure out what is in your life that's taking your energy and then you have to figure out how to balance your energy budget so that you can restore and replete. So what are the things that restore your energy? Well, sleep is an obvious one. Any way for you to stop and just recharge. But a lot of people, um, you know, I think a lot of people don't understand that just taking time to yourself, not having to speak or do anything that is requiring your time and your energy, that's an important way to recharge as well. Just being able to dial back and go quiet for a little bit, shutting the phone off, even if it's just an hour, is enormously beneficial. So these are two of the things. And then, of course, you talked about, you know, it's not just willpower, but you also talked about the power of your language is really important. And that's something I go into a little bit in the book as well, because when we have all of those fears sitting in our subconscious, that runs our inner dialogue and that starts to wear away at us and our ability to interact with our life in the ways that we want to, in our intentional ways. And so it's, it's working against us. So being really mindful of what your inner dialogue is, what your language is saying to you and how it's stopping you and how to shift those language patterns can be enormously powerful as well. Zara, there's someone listening to this podcast right now, and they feel like they are just stuck in this transactional world where they're handling this or putting out this fire, they're dealing with these kids, and they feel like they don't have that happiness that's in their life. They don't have that satisfaction. I know they definitely want to definitely read your book to understand more, but what is that one tip that you would give to somebody to be a little bit happier tomorrow? Like I said, I think, you know, I can give you many strategies to improve the quality of your life. What I tried to do is, you know, in the book, I've taken the top 18 that are really simple strategies that you can implement in less than 10 minutes per day. But if I was to give you one tip, one takeaway is when you wake up in the morning, 
try to start your life intentionally. So instead of allowing your unconscious mind to take you through your day on autopilot, if you can just figure out a moment when you wake up somewhere between your shower and your coffee or your kids, if that's, you know, if that's what you have in your life is take that five or 10 minutes in the morning just to really think about your intentions and set your intention for the day. So you can do that a number of ways. You can practice gratitude and just really have a moment where you let that wash over. You think about the elements in your life that you're truly grateful for, because I promise you it's impossible to be stressed and grateful at the same time. It's impossible to not be mindful when you're having a moment of gratitude, but when you're feeling grateful, It's easy to feel joyful at the same time, and it's easy to feel happy at the same time. So if you start your day off just with that, either gratitude or setting your intentions for the day, it sets the tone for the entire day and starts your day off in the right mindset. And then throughout the day, the easiest thing to do is just daydream back to those moments when you're happy, when you're grateful, when you're feeling peaceful, and just ask yourself, how do I want to feel right now? Because I promise you, nobody's going to say, I'd like to feel stressed right now. Hmm. Most people will say, you know what? I want to feel peaceful, calm, happy, or in your case, Chris, free. (laughs) (laughs) That is great advice. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to hop on the mics with us. For the folks that want to stay up to date with you, all the incredible things that you have going on in your life, and also get your book, what are the best ways that people can do that? Sure. You can go to sixweekstohappy.com or you can go to getzen.com, G-E-T-Z-E-N-D.com. Start your journey today. Most people are either surviving or thriving. If you want a different outcome, then we need to change our behavior. And if you want to change your behavior, then we need to learn how to think and feel differently. And don't feel like you have to do it on your own. Every successful athlete or business person I know has a coach. It doesn't matter if it's Tony Robbins or Tiger Woods you know, it's okay to get a coach and help you through this thing called life. You know, like I said earlier, there's hundreds of strategies I can teach to improve the quality of your life, whether it's better health, more love, stronger social life, or to make more money and have that financial freedom we all seek. But if you want to learn the top 18 strategies and do it in just six weeks, you can learn how to do that with this book. Go to sixweekstohappy.com and start your journey today. Excellent. Thank you for a great episode and also those resources that will drop in the show notes for everyone. And with that, we'll see everyone next time. Thank you. If you found value in this content, it would mean the world to us if you shared it on social media, sent it to a friend, or talked about it over coffee. Thank you.